This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Hello. What's up? Nothing. Just same old nothing. <laughs> I think it's four days until I'm technically fully vaccinated, but in my mind, I'm fully vaccinated. Right. As soon as that shot was in, you're like, you're going to run around, find the most people you can. <laughs> I just like hulked out. Last week we talked about my side project and I had to abandon Stripe checkout. So I've been kind of a period of mourning this week. But other than that, things are pretty good. That's too bad. I just did a, the Stripe checkout video for Go Rails this week. <laughs> there was just no way to rectify it with sales tax. You change your shipping address in the middle of checkout host. I can't do anything. Plus, I can't use their dynamic tax rates because I'm not uploading the products to Stripe 2. Well, that's fine. What did you end up doing for that? I got into gardening and just gave up on computers. So. <laughs> Very nice. I used a tax rate API called like Zip Tax or something. And hmm. I built my own checkout because glutton for punishment. And so Basically, like when you enter your zip code, I'm just firing off a request to get the tax rate. And it tells me, like, should I tax shipping, things like that. And then I'm just re-rendering. It's like a, a cheap version of Hotwire. I'm just like rendering out a partial that has all the totals. And that's my life. That's what I'm doing. Nice. Yeah. That works nicely. I know that like the paddle stuff for payments is kind of similar it's javascript but it'll go update the total and whatever as you put in your details and your currency and coupons or whatever it's kind of similar concept there yeah that works nicely i think you know i got a live update because you can choose local pickup with this service but it's all good i'm sure i'll have more to chat about in a later episode today though i think we would be wise to just jump right in. We have Joel Hawksley with us from GitHub and of my personal interest view component. Uh, Joel, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. It's good to be back. I guess I chatted with you, Andrew, on the Ruby blend. Yeah. Yeah. RIP. <laughs> well, close enough to back because when that show ended, I guess I was already on Remote Ruby, but it kind of switched yep. full focus to it. It feels like it was on Remote Ruby, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, because yeah, Chris was there. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, no one else could show up. So it was me and Chris. Yeah. I think Ron might have been there. It was a good one. So when was that? That was quite a while back now. That was in May of last year, I think. Just as the pandemic began. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So exactly. just put me on the calendar for spring of 2022 while we're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it a yearly thing. For those who may have not listened to the Ruby Blend episode, would you mind just maybe giving a, a quick intro and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Joel. I'm an engineer on the design infrastructure team at GitHub. We're the team that builds kind of our system of systems, our design system called Primer. And it comes in many various forms. It has you know CSS framework, React components, icons, has a Figma library, kind of what you'd expect in a modern design system. What I do on the team is I manage kind of the technical ownership of how people use our system in the Rails stack. Very cool. Do you ever have to work with the React stuff at all, or do you just stay in the Rails land? We do a lot of coordination between the two sides of things. I personally, I don't think I've actually written a commit into the React code base, but we like to keep our APIs almost shockingly consistent between the two, because we expect engineers at GitHub to kind of skip back and forth in between the two stacks. I would be interested to know if, I mean, if you have an answer to this. So like GitHub, obviously one of the most like famous Rails apps, kind of the Rails, the Rails way, air quotes, if you will, is a lot of server rendered HTML. But obviously, like you mentioned, you have React components. If you just guess a number about how much is written in React, so we have a fair amount written in React. None of it is currently customer facing. There are some new products we're working on that should be public in the near future, near to not so near future, that use React for higher levels of interactivity for certain new things we're building. 
So today, as a customer of GitHub, you, I don't believe, will interact with any React code. Gotcha. Good. <laughs> I'm kidding. Here we go. It's, we're, we're like three minutes in, Andrew. Triggered. <laughs> Took long enough. Cool. So view component, I would love to talk some, when I say some, I mean a lot about that. We use that quite a bit. I started using that on side projects. I have a little bit of experience with React and I'm very enamored by the idea of components. But prior to that, I just kind of counted it as loss in Rails because all I really had was partials. Hmm. So maybe I guess we can, before we get into view component, do you mind maybe kind of sharing what it is and how it came about? So view components are subclasses of a view component base, which is you know your typical Rails framework architecture. They are objects that you can pass into the render method in Rails. In Rails 6.1, there is this functionality that was introduced in 6.1. It basically is a certain wrapper around objects that respond to the render in method. That's a patch that I wrote with Aaron Patterson, Tenderlove for Rails. The view component framework also has a monkey patch that includes that effectively that change. So if you want to use it with older versions of Rails, I think we support like 5, 2, and above or something like that. But quite simply, view components are Ruby objects that when they are rendered, return markup. I say that delicately because people have started using them for things besides HTML. I used to say HTML, and now people are using them for JSON, they're using them for XML. So basically anything you traditionally use a Rails view for, we're now providing an object that does the same job as that view with a lot of nice improvements. I'm interested in the JSON part because we recently started using them to set up props for React components. Mm. Um, it's a really interesting use case. So view component gives us a way to write components, kind of take us a, a slice of HTML and, or I guess in this case, anything that's view related, but gives us a way to also interact uh, with Ruby to get the data we need or such for that. When did that kind of come about, like that idea for view component? Sure. So... And explain this, I kind of think about like a couple experiences I had that led to thinking of this idea. The first one was actually using just using React in general and seeing a lot of the architectural benefits, even just like the nomenclature that came with the React architecture, I thought was really effective in describing how you architect UI in the most generic sense. Having worked in React at a company called Galvanize prior to working at GitHub, we started using that React on Rails gem. And we would use it so that we could sprinkle in React components on top of our mostly server-rendered app. Over time, though, we started using it in a way that was suspect to me and that we would use these, uh, this React on Rails gem to render static content, things that weren't even interactive. And we did that because it was possible to write unit tests for those components. So you, know, you might have a component that takes like three different parameters, and those parameters cause some branching logic to occur in the component. That's really hard to test in the Rails stack because you got to spin up a browser to do that. So we were able to mount these React components in this kind of, you know, JS DOM or something like that. It's been a while, forgive me. But we were able to unit test them directly, and it was like basically free. It was very fast. We started using them for testability reasons. and. That was kind of like the main seed. It took a while then. I, you know, I switched companies, joined GitHub, started to get my footing in our code base and really started to see where we could benefit from something like a highly testable, really just what I would call like a first class abstraction around writing view code. And we built a prototype. Like I said, Aaron Patterson was really influential and he kind of paired up with me almost on a weekly basis for months writing the original implementation and it's kind of just been a gradual climb from there. It's been adding new features, fixing bugs, just kind of nonstop for the past couple of years now. I've noticed it's evolved a lot. You've done a really good job of like saying, this is like an experimental thing we're trying, which has been good for us because we started using it pretty early at Podia. I'm curious, have you had any experiments that you've tried that maybe didn't work out with View Component? Or maybe you want to share some of the things that like were experiments that were really successful as well? Yeah, sure. I think that, you know, so you mentioned like this experimental approach and really what it's been is this is the first time I've really lived the Semver life, 
trying to change my software engineering practices to align with Semverse. Like if you're going to introduce a new feature, like thinking about a way you can do it in what I would call a healthy, sustainable way. So you aren't doing what a lot of software packages do these days and ship a new major release every month. So that's been kind of the reason we've taken that experimental approach. I would say that to a certain extent, the first version of Slots V1 that we just deprecated this week was kind of a failed experiment. I wouldn't say it's failed. I mean, we deprecated it, which it means it's not awesome. Like I would have loved to have that just been the final API. But we learned a lot from that. And then my colleague Blake came in and said, oh, we can do this way better. We should totally deprecate this and build a new version before we ship another major release of the library. Another experiment that we're doing right now is one around CSS encapsulation. And that one, uh, I just have a feeling that it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some twists and turns before that one ends up in a place that we're happy with. Do you mind maybe kind of going into some more on that, what that latest experiment entails and kind of your vision for it? It's a big one. I think of the CSS encapsulation work we're taking on as really the most important thing we've done since writing the first line of code for the framework in terms of the amount of complexity and context that goes into solving a problem like this. So the reason we're looking at CSS encapsulation is really a GitHub specific problem that is, as I like to say, like there are little problems you have as a software engineer and smaller Rails apps that like will just like stop you in your tracks at our scale. So the one we have that on our team specifically that I'm really trying to take on is just our technical debt around CSS. We have a half meg of custom CSS that we throw at you on like a PR page. I think the coverage of that bundle, we use 3% of it on that page. And you can think about that like it's a lot to download. Yes, it gets cached. So that's kind of a problem. But the real problem is actually just the ability for us to move quickly. We're all adults here. We know that CSS is fraught with risks. And really, honestly, the more we've dug into this problem, the more fraught it has been. Like we've tried to make changes. We've tried to do refactorings and we've ended up with visual regressions often at one specific screen width. When you click on one menu and hover over this one thing, that's when it happens. That's kind of the problem space we're in. And one of the tools we think that will eventually help us get out of that is scoping our CSS. So there's less uncertainty around how it actually ends up running in the browser. What does that kind of look like right now? So the prior art we have is that all of our React components are written with styled components. So there's CSS and JS. They reference a theme object that comes from, we actually have this like really cool approach where we have like a primitives library that is independent of our CSS and our React. And that stores like our color scale, our sizing scale, and we use that to generate our CSS and then we embed it in our React components as well. So that's kind of the existing technical proof we have. However, this is where things get really messy because in building view component, we've taken the most stable, what I would say translatable pieces of React and put them in Rails. There are some things that it's just like, okay, calling it a component, it's an object, you render it, cool. That translates really well. But there are some things that are language specific. The way that uh, CSS and JS style components uses those like fenced blocks mixing CSS into JavaScript. We've tried some Ruby implementations. First of all, they don't syntax highlight very well, which to me is like a big turnoff. But also I've gotten feedback that that approach maybe not super compatible with Ruby types, for example. So we probably want to be cautious going down that route for those reasons as well. So that and for a lot of other reasons, we've started to look move towards using the CSS module spec, which is a lighter weight approach than some of the styled components work, which is basically the idea that you take a normal looking CSS style sheet and you take every selector and you perform a hashing operation so that it is globally unique. Then what you do is you store a lookup table that is the original selector and the hashed version. And then in your template, you reference that hash table with the original selector. And then the value of that original selector is the hashed one. So what that means is that your selectors are automatically translated into this globally unique selector that is effectively like locally scoping your CSS. There's obviously a lot more to it than that, but that is like the core technical capability we're trying to add right now. Then those styles would it probably at this point just be thrown into a bundle kind of with the asset pipeline or whatnot. But even that we're kind of trying to figure out. So in theory, you're trying to take this, it's applied to this component, 
but it's not like it's like generating like a style tag, like inline or anything like that. It's actually. That's exactly what it's doing right now, okay. actually. Okay. That's the prototype. And that's why, the, so the pull request that y'all will link to, I'm sure is it's a new process we're trying called an architectural decision record, which is literally like a proposed decision. It's basically like a document that exists to codify what you might have in like an issue or a pull request, but it like to actually write it down in a way that like, if you clone the repo, you could like read about why we wrote this feature the way we did. That's cool. It, uh, it does have inline style tags, but <laughs> so literally I opened this PR like two weeks ago. Now I haven't like done another iteration on it yet, but <laughs> one of the first comments from, I think it was Ilya from, I think he's from Italy. He's uh, on Opal. He works on Opal. He was like, this isn't going to work with caching. <laughs> it's like, cause basically what we did is we looked at the current request and we said, Hey, have you rendered this component yet? If you have don't render the style tag, but that like totally falls apart when you have fragment caching and a component might fall in and out of a cache block. So we're probably going to take a big step back from that and just do the encapsulation bit and just throw it in the global bundle. Cause at least it gets us some safety. It doesn't get us that critical CSS, which is like only serving the CSS you need for a specific page. It gets us kind of halfway there and we'll come back to critical CSS some other time. It's really fascinating. But it's okay if you don't know this because this is a Ruby podcast, not a React podcast. But like with styled components, we just started using it and I feel like it's just like a magical thing. I know that like when I define in React a like a styled component, that it generates this like obscure class name. So I assume that's not actually probably generating the style in line, but doing some kind of thing like you're talking about where it's like in a global bundle. Is that how the React way does it? It's in line, but it's at the top of the page, I think. I've at least attempted to read the source of a couple of these libraries to varying degrees of success. But that's kind of where the paradigm breaks down is that like we're not manipulating the DOM once we've come back from the server. So like we kind of need to be able to kind of assemble these styles in a different paradigm. Also, quite frankly, I don't know how you do view caching with styled components. You might not. This is like actually one of the trickier problems I see happening on the framework right now where we need a lot of help from people. So if you're listening and you like caching, let's talk, <laughs> is that we don't do view caching in GitHub at all. We do not use Rails caching. There's a lot of reasons why. The main one is that a lot of our UI is viewer specific. Like when you're looking at a comment, you can do certain things to that comment that like Andrew can't do, that like Chris can't do. But like me, maybe as like a, yeah, whatever, like there's different permissions. So we don't do a ton of caching, which means that we have to walk this delicate line of like introducing things that like might break caching for other people using the framework, despite the fact that we don't use caching. So it makes it really hard for me to justify working on it as a GitHub employee because we literally don't use view caching, but we don't want to go ship something that like when you just use view component out of the box, it breaks all your view caching in special caching related ways that are incredibly confusing and frustrating. You're like walking a very delicate line of... OSS maintainer and trying to just get your job done at work. Yeah. And the nice thing is that GitHub really sees a lot of value in this project. I consistently have been getting really good support at the company. The fewest people I've had working out with me over the past year has been like three. Oh, wow. So I've been getting a lot of support on the project, you know, across like obviously like the framework. And we're also building out this really aggressively building out our library of primary view components, which is, I think we now have 40 of them and they have. Some of them even have JavaScript now with them, which is pretty cool. And you can, you know, build a lot of GitHub now with view components that are kind of ready made and tested out. I will say that primer view component library is a really nice kind of process for how you would do that. Because I, I saw y'all building that and I was, I kind of dug into it and I was, oh, this makes perfect sense. And within a few hours, I had translated it to work with some offhanded thing that I had created. I was like, this is so dope because then you can get the storybook working and you can have it as an engine and it works great and you could deploy it up to Heroku and this and that. So if anyone's out there and they're listening and they're like, I really want to leverage view components, I'm having a hard time getting buy-in because I'm like, how do I share it across all my apps? Because that's like the real mm -hmm. kind of meat and potatoes and the benefits of having a, a component library like this is that if you have multiple apps, like I do at work, it's one library. You can put it in every single app. And this primer view components repo that y'all have shows a really nice way of doing that. There is one file that scares me every time. But other than that, it's really... it's. Oh, come on. You can't say that and not say what the file is and say why it scares uh, you. It's called like class mapper or something like that. Uh -huh. Classify. Yep. Massive file where it just takes in like all these inputs and it decides 
what the actual class values are. So if you have a component and you do like PX colon four, this class mapper file is what takes that and translates into like, oh, this means padding X four. And it also helps prevent you from, I think adding, maybe that's not in the same file, but it also helps you to not re-add things that already yep. exist as like primitives. Yeah, it kind of enforces what we call system arguments, which are basically like a standard mm-hmm. API that all of our components respond to. But Andrew, that was a great description. You know, we have open roles right now, right? Like, <laughs> I'm happy where I am right now, unfortunately. <laughs> that is a gnarly, gnarly part of the library. And the reason we've done that is very forward looking. Because if you see some of the CSS encapsulation work, you might connect the dots that oh, maybe we don't need to have like, so right now our view components actually wrap our CSS library. But the idea is that we will eventually define our CSS for our design system with our view components. And once you have that coupling, you might just remove the functional class names altogether and use, say, CSS variables to inject a padding left and padding right instead of you know going out to a whole like utility system. So it's really right. what you consider like a, a very complex adapter pattern of sorts. Right. And it like when I was kind of messing with it, at first I was just kind of copying the pattern. I was like, okay, this makes sense. But I was using Tailwind and I very quickly got to the point where I was like, okay, this mapping uh, class, it doesn't make sense to use with Tailwind as much because what it would make sense to use is with Bootstrap. Um, Primer is a great example. Uh, Well, you should know that Primer was actually written by the person who wrote Bootstrap. Oh, so it's no cool. surprise. Yeah. He works. Oh, yeah, I was like, they are yeah. very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Otto, MDO, runs our brand studio at GitHub, but that's how he joined was actually uh, having worked on Bootstrap. Nice. But it doesn't work as well for Tailwind. And I think in that instance, you either want to think of how you want to abstract your Tailwind classes into CSS, or you just don't really need that class mapping library. And you're going to lose a few benefits by not using that. But then you don't have to do all this extra work to like mapping or what Tailwind classes are valid. Like I went down that path for a little bit of like taking the Tailwind JSON file that you can extract from it and like putting it into Ruby. And then I was like, this is stupid. It's 5 a.m. and this makes no sense. But yeah, it's a gnarly class, but it's cool. It's cool. It's a cool way to think about it. So if you're out there and you're like, hey, I want to build this for my team that we'll link it in the show notes. It's a great kind of starting point, I think. And it's MIT. Yeah, I would really hope that we can get to a point where that class doesn't exist. I feel like there's some like pithy comment I make it made at the top of that file that's like, please change this file. <laughs> it's well tested. I don't like it. Right. And a couple of people here at work have taken the bait, thankfully. One of the really cool things that uh, we started to experiment with that I really like about having this library is that we can batter it with test coverage because it's not our monolith. We can 10x test coverage and it wouldn't matter. So we've been like messing around with things like We just uh, recently added allocation testing for that class. We can now say, I perform this operation and I allocate 38 objects in Ruby. So if you want to go in and reduce the allocations of this class, you can just run it against this test. And in CI, it will fail you if you add more allocations. It's been really fun to see that. We've also been looking at, uh, have you guys used Cooprite yet? I have. I love Cooprite. So we're looking at Cooprite and there's some, I have some wild ideas for Cooprite, man. One of the things that you can do that we've been looking at, obviously, as you can tell, visual regressions are like what keep me awake at night. Just like GitHub's UI breaking is my personal cross to bear. But one of the things we've been thinking about is that with Cooprite, since it's using the Chrome DevTools protocol, you can give it a node and it will give you the entire computed styles for that node. So our theory is that we should be able to snapshot an entire document's computed style tree. And then, oh, nice. and persist that and do what I would call like a programmatic visual diff because that computed style tree is what goes into the rendering engine. So it's like the, not the last step, but like basically the last step before Chrome actually renders the thing, which means you can use that as like a derivative of what you traditionally use like screenshot testing for. So, yeah. so the thing is that, I mean, we haven't, I've built a prototype of this, but if someone else wants to build it ahead of me, please. But we've like figured out that like, you know, you could, if you had a good diffing algorithm for JSON trees, you could literally be like, oh yeah. That's what you think that's refactor. Well, this node, yeah, it changed from like light gray to dark gray on your PR. Did you mean to change that from dark gray? I'm pretty excited about being able to do that kind of thing. As you can imagine, these components are used like hundreds of times in our application. Like it's a huge, incredibly sensitive point code-wise for us at the company. 
if we break the blank slate, we use it like 500 times in the app. It's going to break the entire app. That reuse kind of goes both ways. Right. Have you ever heard of Percy? Yeah. Don't they do it's screenshot a, testing? Yeah, it's a visual like screenshot testing and it works with Rails. So I was, yep. for the anyone out there who's kind of interested in this idea of like, oh, I would like to be able to diff my few pages and you, you don't want to start parsing and diffing like the stuff inside the Chrome engine. Percy is a nice tool to use. Yeah, the screenshots are great. I mean, we've looked into it a couple times. My gosh, we have like three long running issues that are like, set up visual regression testing for github.com. And it just doesn't scale for us. We've also seen, at least in our explorations, there was a lot of false negatives or false positives. And the really thing we're trying to grapple with is that like sometimes these bugs are like breakpoint related. How do you start to get to a point where like you can be like, okay, I'm going to test this page at three widths. I guess you could do that with screenshots, but that just like further adds permutations to your, your testing stack. Are you saying you don't want to like run Puppeteer and write permutations for all those widths? And then also, depending on the browser, that can also change things. You don't want to do that? Uh, not, not exactly. Not exactly. <laughs> no, the, that's like ultimately what we're trying to solve with this library, though, is that like we've got 4,700 templates in our application. I think I counted, I ran some analysis. We have like 2,000 Git routes in our application, which means that's that like chunky, it's a like, chunky boy. How do you keep all those things looking good? I don't know. And that's the thinking with this library is that like, if we can get everything, like as much of GitHub as possible into this like narrower subset of UI components, especially the pages that like aren't super like fun, like settings pages, there should be no custom code for those pages. Zero. Because if there is, that's like another thing that we got to check when we change something global. And that's the next two years of my life solving that problem right there. That sounds fun, I think. Yeah. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, HoneyBadger.io. One of the things that's really tricky about error monitoring is that when you get an error, it could have come from anywhere. It could have come from a background job or a user doing some weird thing and they have JavaScript turned off. You never know. And so you might get these stack traces, but you might not know how to debug them. And that is really a pain in the butt. So Honey Badger has a really cool feature called breadcrumbs, and you can integrate their client-side and server-side libraries so that you can track what was going on when an error occurred. So for example, you have a front end, it has a button to go sign up, your user clicks that, and it makes a post request to your API, and your API has a failure response, and then your JavaScript has an error because, well something went wrong on the back end. Well, what's really cool is that you're able to track all of that with Honey Badger and see the steps that actually happened in the browser and the server side. So you can go replicate those steps and try it yourself and actually replicate those errors and actually solve the bugs. And that is super cool because if you're just trying to look at the stack trace and you don't know what happened that led to that, it's really tough. So Honey Badger can really save you a bunch of time. I think that is one of my favorite features that they offer. And, you know, like we've said before, they have check-in monitoring. So if you've got cron jobs or like regular scheduled background jobs or anything like that, you can have those check in with Honey Badger and make sure that they're running. So you can feel confident that, yes, your cron jobs actually are running. So that's it. I just wanted to give them a shout out. We love Honey Badger and they've been a long, long time supporter of everyone in the Rails community and they will continue to be. So check them out. They've got a generous free tier. There's really no reason not to use them. One thing that we've kind of been talking about this from a perspective of like people who have used components, people that maybe know about what's going on in React land and things like that. I actually mentor a junior who is using components at work and he's kind of coming into this. And I was like, hey, man, do you have any questions? This would be for the people out there who maybe haven't used the library or haven't even started thinking about building Rails apps in terms of components. And I asked him for a few questions. And if you want to answer a few of those, I think that would be helpful. Let's do it. I got to see what my blind spots are, man. I've got the curse of knowledge having been knee deep right? in this for so long. And I think some of these are like, I think I could answer as well, but it would be interesting to get your take. One of them is, when do you reach for the partial over the component? Never. At what point? Never. I like that answer. That's, like that's, that actually, answer the, that's actually like the easiest answer. I mean, I be, we become much more confident with that now that we've done 
500 view components in our application right now. That doesn't include the ones we've open sourced. So we're pushing like 550 in GitHub. The common way you make a view component is either you take a partial and you realize how much data you are passing into it implicitly and you actually test it properly for the first time. Or you take what we call a view model, which is like our presenter, and you write DOM tests against it for the first time. Those are kind of like the two entry points. But if it's a partial, like a partial says, I'm going to reuse it. To me, reuse means test because we test all the code that we reuse as Ruby developers. I think it's like a pretty clear argument at this point. I would love to hear someone provide valid arguments for using a partial over a view component. I can't think of any off the top of my head, though. I can't think of any either. But it is that in that situation where you're like, oh, well, I think what I've seen is a lot of people get tripped up and they're not writing components that are atomic enough, hmm. right? And so that's where they get into the situation of like, okay, maybe I do need a partial here because like my component doesn't work here. And whenever I hear my component doesn't work here, that to me says, number one, you have differences in styling that you have lack of consistency, which is an organizational thing, or your components aren't atomic enough. When you were on the Ruby blend last time, you said that you guys had a lot of success in building components out of smaller components. Is that still the case? Yeah. So that's kind of like where the design system comes in. Like you will, we often have this kind of two layered approach where you take effectively an active record model and you turn it into primer view components. So you're like, I've got a repo. I'm going to turn it into a card. I'm going to take attributes from that repo or repository, sorry, and turn it into a box or something like that. Or I'm going to take a list of users and I'm going to turn it into a stack of avatars. And at that point, if you create these atomic components, in my head, the way I think about it is like, then you can start getting better inheritance where you're like, okay, I have my base component or application component, whatever. I think y'all use base component. I tend to use application component for no reason other than application helper and things like that. We use base Um, component because there is no application per se in primer view components because it's just a library. uh, Internally, we use application component. Nice. That's good to know. And then at that point, though, you can start building them like, okay, maybe I need like a stack of avatars. You could take like an avatar component or that's where you can start getting a little bit better with inheritance. But you can only get to that point if you have atomic components. And I think that's what I tend to see as the biggest issue. Like people try to, when they start using view component, they're like, okay, I'll just translate my partial into a component. But that's mm-hmm. not the way I would suggest doing it. What, what do you think about that? I think it goes both ways. It depends on how strong of a system you have in your company. We do plenty of partial conversions that are just as you describe, where it's just this thing was used. We have some partials that are used like hundreds of times in our app, which is insane to me. Even if the template stays exactly the same and it's 200 lines, you're going to get some benefit out of that. Like I wouldn't dissuade people there, but Thinking this way like naturally exposes certain architectural flaws that were hidden before. When you don't have to define an interface for something, the implicit interface can grow unbounded. Versus, we all know that if you look at a Ruby class and you have 20 arguments to your initializer, you're going to feel bad about it. And uh, you're, going to be more motiv- you're going to be more motivated to change. So often what I say is, turn it into a view component, get your test passing, land the PR. Then go make the changes. I'm a real stickler for only having one refactor and process at a time. I don't like to do multiple change types at the same time. So if you're converting to a view component, don't also set up a design system. Set someone without ADHD off. (laughs) That's my problem every time. I'm like, oh, I need to create a component. I'm like, oh, well, I need to create a design system while I'm here. This one's a little bit more generic and we've kind of touched on several aspects of this already, but what to you makes a good component? Because React has Mm. like different libraries have their different things and like different primitives. And I think the system arguments thing is one thing that I really like or system props, however you want to call it, where all your very generic classes go into like the top level so that they can be used in every single component if needed. MB1, stuff like that. But other than things like that, where you can create these abstractions, what makes a good component? I think I actually have a pretty good answer for you. And the answer is conceptual compression. So conceptual compression is when you take a bit of complexity and you provide an abstraction around it that enables someone to leverage that complexity, the outcome of that complexity without paying the cost of it. So a great example of this that I use in my RailsConf talk that's coming out next week is uh, mailers. And we have components for writing mailer code. That is like the worst of the worst. So that's like a really easy answer is something that like you want to just provide an interface around so that someone else can use it correctly. The forward-looking answer to that is actually accessibility. 
that if you like, this is something that is becoming a really big priority for us at the company, somewhat as a result of our acquisition with Microsoft, Microsoft is very high accessibility standards. Something I didn't necessarily know when we got acquired, but it's been really cool to see like folks from that side come and just really educate us on what it takes to make something useful for someone who is say color blind or blind. Those standards are high. And some of the things that you need to do to make something accessible cannot be automated, at least from what they say. Some of the folks I work with have been doing this for a long time. So if you're going to try and design something that's accessible, you really want to capture that overhead and be able to reapply it throughout your application. Like if we bother to make a drop down that is perfectly tabbable and when you use a screen reader, like announces to people correctly, we shouldn't be doing that every time we use a drop down. We should have a technical approach that enables us to have drop downs that work for people who are not able to see very well. And those are some examples of like, I think the way we should conceptually be thinking about components is they need to be solving problems. If they're not solving a problem, it's an abstraction. A partial is lighter weight. If you don't feel like it's solving a problem for you, maybe use a partial, maybe just drop it in your template. But with 10% of the people in the United States having a disability, I think it's really important to start thinking about what our uh, UI abstractions are really serving at our companies. And for us, it, that is the way we're looking through it now. That is a fantastic answer. And I think a lot about accessibility. Unfortunately, for most companies, they're like, hey, we don't really care about this right now because we don't have time. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that answer is that you may not have time now, but in the future when you have to do it, you're going to be screwed because doing it from day one makes it way easier. And the reason accessibility is hard because most people don't start doing it from day one. And then when they have to do it, like Domino's, that recent case with Domino's where they got sued because their site wasn't accessible. I think the quote to like be able to make the site accessible was several million dollars. You yeah. know, it's an incredible amount of money. So every time you don't make something that's accessible in your application, you are adding technical debt, whether you know it or not. Yeah. And I think that that's what a lot of conceptual compression ultimately is. It's a technical debt mitigation strategy. Sure, you can go hard code your emails all day long, but as soon as you want to change them, good luck. I think that's the same thing here. As you can imagine from what I've said, this is going to be a real challenge for us. That's the journey. We actually just had someone uh, join my team, a new engineer, and she's coming in as, as an accessibility expert. And that's going to be like, you know, kind of that uh, maybe touches on another aspect of this project, which is that we have started to define a maturity life cycle for our components. So for primer view components, we now have stated criteria for alpha, beta, and stable. Where alpha, we restrict the access. Beta, it's something that we encourage people to use. But stable is going to be where we actually require people to use the pattern in our application. In each of those steps, we have certain criteria. For stable, it's likely going to be that it's had an accessibility audit. That we can say, hey, okay, when you use this component, you're going to be encouraged to do something for accessibility. I'm not going to claim that it's going to be some panacea, but like that we'll have guidelines and that, you know, you as an engineer that doesn't know much about accessibility can come in and do something that isn't inaccessible, at least. Nice. Kind of shifting a little bit while we're kind of running low on time here. Is there anything that anyone's doing with view components that you looked at and you're like, I didn't think about that. That's super cool. And one example is Bridgetown, which is a static site generator for Ruby, has really kind of embraced view components. Jared White, who I see all over the view component library, commenting on PRs and stuff, he's started to port over basically an implementation of that for Bridgetown. One thing that was really cool is he actually used the primer system component library, just added the gem to a Bridgetown app and it just works. What are some cool things that you've seen around that? I mean, that is one of the, one of the main ones I think is like really fascinating. That's something that's on my kind of like long-term radar is adding Jekyll support for view component. We do a fair amount of our marketing work but with static sites, as you can imagine, GitHub probably uses GitHub pages for a lot of things, including some of our marketing sites. So that's definitely on my list. I think someone I saw someone the other day was using view components to be like a serializer. So effectively using it to like turn an active record object into, I think it was actually an elastic search query, which is a JSON format. That's like Someone's totally wild. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's incredible. That's, that's pretty wild. You know, honestly, I actually keep like a whole record of these things. And one of the things that we do 
that I think is really cool at GitHub is that when you're working on some big project like this, we kind of keep a, an internal blog. So like every week I just post like a couple cool things on an issue that a bunch of higher ups subscribe to and they get to see like cool stories about what we've done. I think like a, another area of interest is async behaviors. I haven't seen anyone really dig into Hotwire too much explicitly, but there's definitely like some interesting opportunities there. We've done some experiments internally that so far haven't gone super well, but we were trying to do some like pretty esoteric things. I kind of mentioned the memory allocations is kind of like the one of the big ones. Like I've never seen a test for memory allocations before in my entire career working in Ruby. So that's kind of a cool one. Another one has been like, you know, our, I don't know if you saw, but our primer view components library, it actually, we published an NPM package now alongside of it. So that's like another, we didn't even go into like asset packaging and delivery, but that's like probably actually really the next frontier. Like we talked about CSS encapsulation, but really what we're trying to figure out is what is the Rails vision for asset delivery and like how can view component maybe inform that or at least be compatible with what we think we're going to be doing in Rails 7 around assets. What are your predictions? Where do you think this is going? Oh, gosh, that's a, <laughs> that's a leading question. <laughs> it's such we a all lead. have very strong opinions. I think that my overarching engineering philosophy is that simplicity is the only long-term solution. What I like about Rails is that like, it's so invisible, like, especially the old asset pipeline. You write some CSS and it works. What does it look like to go getting back to a point where like, I can write some CSS next to a component and it just works, but it works in a way that is safe. I would love to know what they do at Basecamp for like managing CSS. Like what is their approach? Like we hear a lot about stimulus, but I'm on a mostly CSS driven area of the company. And, you know, we do some JavaScript. You don't hear a lot about if there's, I mean, maybe they just use the asset pipeline and there's nothing else to say, but I'd be really curious to know what they're doing in terms of what I think the future is. I can tell you actually, like there's like a core organizational problem that I can't crack yet. And it's that when you have an application our size, and you have like, let's just say you have 100,000 lines of CSS. How do you organize that CSS so that you only have the right CSS served like on the right page? Do you split it up by like area of the app? We've tried that, but if you reuse your partials across the app, you can't confidently know what is going to be rendered on the page to then serve the right bundle. So that's kind of failed for us. We've literally just thought about writing style tags in our templates at this point. Like, and I actually think that's probably a pretty viable strategy. Both of those things to me just like don't feel right. So like, well, I don't have like a strong answer for you, Jason, about like where I think we're going to be. There's a certain amount of discomfort about the current situation that to me makes me think it better not be where we're at right now. And luckily our industry moves a lot. So we know that we won't be where we're at right now, even six months from now. I think there's a lot of people, we've talked about assets probably more than like any other topic on this show that in Hamill, but like, I think a lot of people feel the same way about, we don't love where we're at with assets. I was really happy to start using on the JavaScript side, like ES6, stuff like that. So like I welcomed Webpacker, but like I kind of fell out of love with it and I missed the asset pipeline. And at the same time though, I'm really interested in the problem you talked about, which is how do you serve a slice of assets is there a way you can do that simply? And I like I obviously have no answer for that, but it's very interesting. Who would have thought getting into programming that serving style sheets would be like the thing we were losing sleep on? Well, and I think that there's a lot of parallels in between the JavaScript and the CSS space. They are both languages that at the very highest level uh, were never meant to do what we're trying to do with them. We don't talk about how to deliver the right Ruby to the right action at the right time. For better or for worse, that paradigm doesn't have these kinds of really what I call structural issues. CSS, I, I think, is like even ultimately even more fraught than JavaScript. The term I like to use, it's a pit of failure. You are constantly trying to not fall into this pit of despair where you've just like written a bug that you don't even know you wrote until six months later, someone in an old build of Firefox tells you that like they can't click this button. That's a hard world to operate in. And the only path I can see out of this right now is to just like do less do fewer things and become more confident in those fewer things. And to me, that is components. If you can reduce the complexity and deviation in your interface, you are, I believe, way more likely to deliver a higher quality experience when it comes to that fraught language than if you have a mountain of custom CSS. It really paints like a picture of the whole like idea of why you're trying to get this new uh, style thing into view component. Like, 
it all makes very, it all makes a lot of sense to me. And I'm rooting for it to happen. I don't envy the process of getting there, but neither do I. I think that a lot of people, whether or not they're saying it, are really behind y'all and what you're doing and whether or not they're on the repo actively commenting and making issues and stuff. I think everyone's kind of rooting for y'all to come mm. out with something super clean that we can all use. At least well, I am. It's, it's really helpful to hear that. I, it's been really amazing. All the people have, have contributed to this project. I think uh, GitHub's contributions has been like in terms of number of contributors, we're about 10% of the contributors to the framework. Okay. We've obviously contributed a good portion of the code, but like even if people just want to drop by and say, Hey, this was confusing to me. I've been working on the documentation recently. We just shipped a brand new documentation site and I was writing all this and I'm like, I have no clue if this makes sense. I'm like the creator of this framework. I know every line of code. I've rewritten these docs three times. I've been around this for like years. I have no clue if they're useful. So like if people are going out and reading this project and like something doesn't make sense, odds are the docs aren't good and I want to hear about it. Obviously, PRs are my favorite. I, I like them more than issues, but I'll, I'll take issues if people want to bring issues. PR is accepted, folks. Yeah. I was like very amped at the idea that view component was somebody had opened a PR. Maybe it was you to get it into Rails. It was me. Yeah. Okay. And like, I was like, this is going to be awesome. And then one day it was, this isn't going to be put into Rails. What happened there was... yeah. What was kind of the reasoning they didn't want to bring it into the framework itself? There's a, obviously a lot of dimensions to this question. You know, Rails is a vision for how you should build web applications. And I think that the reason Rails succeeds is because of its focus, generally, at least in, in any specific area. Like, obviously, Rails does a lot of things, but it generally does things one way. And I think as you, like, you might read between the lines for me saying that way, that like introducing a second way of doing something is difficult. As it should be. I will say that looking back two years later, that what we had is not what we have right now. And that is very sobering when I think about like trying to get this into the framework that like, hey, it's a lot different than it was then. What does that say about the state it was in? What does that say about like our chances now versus then? I'm just happy that it didn't make it in and it's in the form that it was in because it's so much better at this point. And I would have feared that we would have, you know, anytime an API lands in Rails, it really firms up that API you're not going to be able to change it. We would have probably gotten half as far as we are right now. It probably would have been fine, but things would have been different. And I think that's kind of where we're trying to get at is that like over time, we are boiling down like what actually matters out of this framework, like what truly is important. What are we identifying that like Rails isn't doing? And that list is not really getting longer. For me, it's like testability. It's being able to put a Ruby API on a view ultimately pretty basic things. And I think that, you know, we're working towards the third major release of the framework. I'm hoping it'll be sometime later this year. But what our hope is that as we get to that point, what that release will really signal is here's what we think could go into Rails. And then we can start the conversation of saying, hey, what does it look like for Rails to have these capabilities? Not let's put, let's just like lift and drop into the repo, but like, how do we add a Ruby API to a, an existing template in Rails in a way that is conceptually backwards compatible so that someone coming into the framework can understand it and not have to like make some huge jump? That might have to change the way like we've thought about view components, especially like their encapsulation, because uh, like, for example, Rails views exist in a global scope. So we might have to give that up. Even if we can still test them, we might have to give up the fact that like currently they don't allow you to just like access every single thing from the environment. That's kind of how I view the project today is really trying to be a proving ground for new ways of thinking about building UI. Like the CSS encapsulation is a perfect example. I would love to come up with something awesome and brilliant and be like, hey, if you do these like slight tweaks, maybe that is actually what Rails needs. And then we've made that technical contribution. And all of us have experimented with this pattern in our apps in a way that we can learn those lessons and apply them to Rails, you know, going forward. That is one of the most badass answers to a question I've ever heard. So that was awesome. The render functionality, was that kind of, the new render functionality in six one was that inspired by the view component library or was that just a separate conversation that was already happening? When we decide not to, when I say we, like it was me, Aaron, and a couple of members of the core team 
I prefer to like not get into specifics. Like obviously we talk about these things in private and like, it's, there's a lot going on, but what we decided was that an API that would allow view component to function pretty seamlessly was the right way forward. So anyone else can build a component API. I have yet to see someone do it, but that was kind of the agreement was like, Hey, I think actually DHH came up with that API and suggested it that you know, we call it render in because render in takes a view context. So you're saying, take this object and render it in this view context. That has served us well. The thing that we're looking at right now, my colleague Blake is looking at how to make sure forms work properly in view components. That's like kind of one of the last technical hurdles. We're starting to see some trip ups with how Rails forms assume a global output buffer. So that might necessitate a few upstream changes, but generally it's worked. I kind of hinted at this earlier, but I'm guessing there are a few technical compromises we could make in view component that would make it more Rails compatible. It's likely generally making it less encapsulated and a little bit more permissive in its architecture. So that's kind of where I see us going architecturally, though. Chris, Andrew, anything y'all want to chat about before we go? I don't think so. I was just enjoying listening to the conversation today. So (laughs) I'm looking forward to your RailsConf talk, too. What are you talking about in that? So uh, we touched on some of it today. Actually, what's really nice is that because I had to write that talk so long ago, we touched on the, like, the natural extension of it, I think, pretty well. That talk is called View Components in the Real World, and it really just kind of goes over at a very high level how we've worked on the open source aspects of this, how we've really driven internal adoption. It talks about heavy use of ASTs for static analysis for some of our problem spaces, which is really cool. Just like generally like how we're attacking this large scale problems of view architecture and rails. It's kind of wandering in a way. I feel like it's like the least focused talk I've given, but I really just tried to like pack it with like all the interesting stuff we're doing so people can like get a little peek behind the curtain of what it's like to build rails at massive scale. I like when you mentioned testing allocations is an interesting one. I was just working on the page M's like ability to so it's set up where like you can add, say this customer is going to check out with Stripe or Braintree or whatever. And being able to like intercept seamlessly and say like you assigned a new credit card token from the JavaScript, but you called subscribe. So we should go and update their card before we subscribe. It was making me think of that where I'm like, I want to make sure I'm not making too many API requests to Stripe and I'm doing it as efficiently as I can. And oh, I- Th- that's Needing kind of a way the, to test that, you know, same kind of thing. That's right. I, you just reminded me that, like, I mentioned the memory thing. This is the curse of knowledge. I've talked people's ears off about this. But the reason we did the memory allocation one is that we've been doing the database query one forever. So we actually redefined the inline render helper in our application to use the MySQL instrumenter. And it counts the number of queries that have executed in the current request before and after you render the component. And then what we do is we default that to zero. Which means that if you write a view component that runs database queries, you have to declare exactly how many queries it runs. And that literally means that like, oh, like you can imagine we have different builds. So like when you run GitHub on an enterprise server, like on-prem, things are different. So you might literally have in a render call, when this is on-prem, it renders three queries, but when it's running in the cloud, it runs four queries. And it's like super explicit. It catches people every day. That are like, oh, I didn't know that like checking three feature flags, if I didn't batch it, would give me three queries. But now it's just like a default part of our workflow. So that's an example of something that I'm just like, I forget it even exists, but it's like awesome. And just like now part of life. That is awesome. Because yeah, I think there's so much stuff that's like lazy loaded or just runs in a library or something that you didn't write that you don't really know the details of. If I call it this way, it's going to do one thing. But if I do it the other way, it's going to do twice as much work, And even though I thought it was going to do the same thing. And it's awesome to have that kind of stuff. It's been something that I'm like, that needs to be more of a, a thing that I do in my regular testing and stuff, you know, keeping track of query counts or, you know, API requests and that sort of thing, yeah, especially the, in libraries. Yeah. And the lesson for us has been default to zero. Because you know what, when we're all writing software, in our minds, we're like, this is free. (laughs) So why not have your stack assume what you're already assuming as an engineer? Yeah, that's smart. I really like that. 
Well, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. I know like take an hour out of your day, but I know you put a lot of work and thought into this library. And I joke that we use it religiously at Podia, but we do. We have so many components and we test them and we have a UI library we've been working on and we're now starting to build new components for our UI library. And yeah, I don't know, it's just been a big win for us. So thank you for all your work. You're welcome. It's the most fun. I can assure you. Well, any place people can find you online, any links you want us to share? I'm at hoxley.org. I don't really participate in a lot of the rest of the internet too much. You're not missing out. Yeah. It's pretty wise. Yeah, I, I try to stay on a one-year cycle of, of publishing at this point. So I'll have another talk next year and maybe we can come back and chat about it then. That would keep us on track, right? Spring of 2022. So put it on the calendar. Well, thanks again. And Andrew, Chris, we will chat next week. All righty. Later. <laughs>